Here's a fun fact about me that I'm sure is entirely surprising to hear from a trans woman into horror that spent most of her youth on the internet. I used to be huge into creepypastas. I have fond memories of trawling through the creepypasta wiki, I listen to YouTubers read stories, and I distinctly remember spending hours finding whatever information I could on fake lost episodes of cartoons, hoping to find some proof that maybe, just maybe, they were real. Much as many of them were schlock that I recognize as being full of holes, even at the time, there was something gripping that I couldn't understand until recently when I began reflecting on them. They were my first exposure to any sort of self-aware fiction. Whether that was through how many broke the fourth wall or were sort of a narrative within a narrative thing, that larger than fiction feeling really clicked with me as a youth struggling to understand my own reality. And apparently that vibe seems to stick with a lot of people as well, particularly English gamers, at least judging by how much people adore the meta elements of titles like Undertale and Stanley Parable. And within the realm of visual novels known by English gamers, there is no shortage of notable games that attempt to use meta elements to provide commentary. While I have thoughts about how many are poisoned by irony and genre stereotyping, many are also genuinely fantastic and worth the time to read as both stories and writing critique. However, there is one game that I really think stands above others in this regard. It's one which came out long before Totono, Umineko, DDLC, Danganronpa, and most all the others. One developed by a little studio with only a handful of developers, and one that I would argue does a better job than any other at using those meta narratives self-aware creepypasta vibes to craft an engaging story. A tale which goes as far as to question the very nature of fiction writing and narratives as a whole. That game is Suisenka. Released in 2005 by Flady, one of many brands working under visual arts in their late 90s to mid 2000s post canon success boom, Siri Senka is a difficult game to describe and one that's often even more difficult to read. It's packed with almost cruelly boring slice of life scenes and adult content that requires immense patience to get through. It's wound together by a fractured narrative that borders on headache inducing to make sense of at many points. It's written with prose that feels unnecessarily detailed at times and bounces between writing styles. And to top it all off, it has a structure that feels almost hostile to the player's attempts to craft a cohesive plot in their mind. But the thing is, within all of that are these brief glances at the seams of a world, a narrative that is actively collapsing in on itself with characters as desperate to end the tedium and torture as you are. Those glances at what governs that narrative, that is, the incredibly meaningful meta-narrative that exists above it, are tantalizing like nothing else, and should you see them through, you're paid off of a story that accomplishes what few others can. Sui Senka is a heartfelt, painful exploration of how narratives can become violence. It's a game about how our desperation for a story to explain our chaotic lives can lead us to hurt ourselves and others, about the expectations we put on stories to save us and fix us. And above so, so many other things I hope to detail, it is a game about how we are not hopeless to escape the narratives that trap us. That we can embrace life for the dirty, chaotic, hypocritical, beautiful mess that it is, and live. It is a truly unique title, and one of the few visual novels I've read, alongside Cross Channel and Shinya Yukakimi, that I'd say is damn near perfect in that it accomplishes everything it wishes to and then some, all with some truly incredible style and flair that makes it timeless. Not just as a game and as a story, but as a work of literary and cultural criticism. It is an incredible shame that this game never got localized, and even more of a shame that it just didn't sell well to begin with. This box copy, which I have here, which is bizarrely important to the story, it cost me over $100 to purchase without getting into import fees, and it is the only release this game has ever gotten. There is no digital version, no reprints, only this. And while I think it's kind of fit for a game that is sort of a creepypasta arrogate to be, you know, rare and obscure and a pain in the ass to find, it's still a shame there's less than likely a few thousand of these in existence, relegating the game's accessibility basically to some shady websites. While I'm certain that visual arts could re-release it digitally if there was enough demand, I'm less certain about a translation for reasons I'll get into later. While I'll be doing my best within this video to go over the story and everything I found interesting in the title for those who can't presently play it, I still encourage you all to try it yourselves when you can. And thanks to today's sponsor, Satori Reader, learning the Japanese needed to play games like this is much easier than it used to be. Satori Reader is an app and website developed by the people behind the human Japanese apps, designed to help accelerate your Japanese adventure with fun, engaging stories written just for learners, and a whole plethora of useful tools to break them down as much as you need to make sense of things. While a lot of language learning tools claim to accelerate learning and not deliver on their promises, Satori Reader is one of the few I can vouch for really delivering on that. I've used it plenty and love it. With a subscription, you'll get access to over 1,200 episodes of both written and spoken content, spread across over 20 original 
original stories, news articles, everyday dialogues, grammar lessons, and more. I was personally most fond of the history and news segments, which range from fun little lighthearted tales to legitimately informative stories about current events and concerns. And not just in Japan, but the world as a whole, making it a great way to both stay a bit informed and sharpen your skills. All of that can be adjusted to meet your skill level and learning needs. You can tailor kanji and hurigana used to your knowledge, create spaced repetition cards of audio for memorization, tap on words and set phrases for detailed explanations, and communicate with helpful and friendly staff for more specific aid. On top of all of that, the interface it's wrapped up in is super easy to use and accessible, perfect for both long learning sessions and passing a bit of time in a way that's fun and educational. As someone who's personally seen their skills increase thanks to it, I really can't recommend Satori Reader enough to other Japanese learners. And that's why I'm happy that I get to tell all of you that they're currently having a New Year sale to make their pro subscription even more affordable than it already is. And if you happen to miss that, then there will be a special link down in the description just for viewers of this channel to get a discount. Any time of day, any time of year. Thank you again to Satori Reader for sponsoring this video and giving me the chance to shout out something so cool. I've been hesitant to take on sponsorships for this channel because I think very, very few actually fit these videos and I don't want to recommend garbage I don't personally believe in. So trust me when I say that this app is worth your time. It is 100% worth your time if you're interested in learning and maintaining your Japanese skills. And if all that said, let's finally get to diving deep into this game and why I think it as well is worth your time to explore. Sui Senka follows the life of our hero, Koichi Oyagi, a young man from an affluent family who spends his day in a secluded mansion, pushing for a dull, monochromatic existence, which one day finds new meaning from something unexpected. One of the inhabitants of the mansion, the cruel mistress Mikado Kakyoin, presents Koichi with something to amuse him and bring color to his life. A young, beautiful lady by the name of Mamoru Amauchi, a heroine to suit his heroism. Though she brings color to his life, it's soon revealed that her heroine is a boy, one whom Koichi still loves deeply, and one who still embodies the role of heroine, even if the casting is a bit unusual. And so begins what should be a beautiful life of pure love, which soon reveals itself to be more complex than one's thought, as other people in the manor speak of unknown transgressions and abusive pasts, slowly shattering Koichi's perceptions of everything. Soon, he finds himself dragged back into the world of monochrome, with no choice but to move forward in this story. A story of a man desperately searching for joy and color in a joyless and colorless world, one of pleasurable acts that bring no pleasure, one of characters living out their lives and roles as assigned, and one that with each passing moment seems to come one inch closer to tearing at the seams, worn until there may be nothing left but the secrets within. For as much as Sui Senka spends a decent chunk of its runtime being as tedious to read as literarily possible, credit has to be given where it's due. The opening hours I've just described are some of the most engrossing of almost any visual novel I've played, full of foreshadowing and intrigue that makes it apparent from the very first lines of dialogue that you're in for something special. <laughs> そう。でも、I first attempted to play this game when I was early on in my Japanese learning adventure, and while I might have been quickly filtered by the everything I'll get into later, the opening stole my attention and stuck in my mind until I finally began playing for the title for this video. It's confusing, unsettling, and feels very confrontational towards the player, despite not even breaking the fourth wall. And I want to put particular emphasis on the last part of that sentence, because it's something I'm going to be reiterating on a lot later. Sui Senko's success as a game that is basically about unknowing actors realizing their parts of a story and having existential crises is because everything that happens, though split effectively into two parts, is still part of one cohesive world, all experienced through the same mechanisms. On one hand, you have the part of the narrative, the part that I've just described in the synopsis, the story titled Sui Senka, a fairly typical arrogate plot being performed by, in-universe, basically just a bunch of actors. And on the other hand, you have the part of the meta-narrative, the actual world these characters aren't fully aware they're a part of, which slowly emerges as the story progresses, and eventually boils over to become the main story once a certain point is reached. It's kind of like The Matrix, but with sex. 
Okay, more sex. Playing through the story is done through this main menu, which shows you branches of nodes or events that all stem off the opening hours. Some are incredibly short, consisting of just a few nodes that last mere minutes each, while others take hours to complete, either through having a massive web of events or a couple particularly long ones. What connects the majority of them thematically is, ironically, their disconnection. Much of the experience of playing Suisenka's main narrative feels like going for a fragmented, nonsensical daily life. You open up an event, get greeted by some incredibly boring porn, and move on. You open up an event, get greeted by some incredibly boring slapstick, and move on. You open up an event, maybe get greeted by both at the same time, and move on. All of those completely unrelated to each other, all of them exhausting. And despite that, all of them feel as if they should be enjoyable. After all, they have all the makings of something fun. You have kinky sex with plenty of build-up and appealing artwork. You have slice of life that feels akin to a rom-com anime of the era. And you have moments of slower character building where people just chat. But it all feels like tired tropes playing out, not because they make sense for the narrative, but because they're expected from the media you're consuming. That disconnect is felt from the moment the first adult scene happens, and becomes a thing that simultaneously glues the internal narrative together and is its undoing. The experience of the first two-thirds of Sui Senka is realizing, alongside Koichi and the others, that this main narrative isn't fun. That nothing you're doing within the narrative is fun, and it weaponizes that, carefully inserting sequences that hint at those aforementioned metafictional elements in the midst of all the suffering to keep your interest from ever dwindling too far. Slowly, over time, something else emerges from all those dull scenes as characters show flickers of awareness, trauma, fear, and anger. They show desires to escape their roles, feelings of discomfort with their lives they can't explain, and it becomes clear this stock, trope-laden, boy-meets-girl, pure-love, fluffy hentai rom-com narrative isn't something anyone wants to be a part of. All of those things are what feel the aforementioned themes inside the meta-narrative, and the tension Hain creates between the two fictions clashing is seriously impressive. While there isn't much out there that I can compare Sui Senka to that's actually illustrative, one of the few examples of something similar that does exist is the original Dragon Guard. This copy is stained with cat piss. For those who have not played it, Dragon Guard 1 is an action game developed by Kavia and directed by Yoko Taro as the first entry to the Dragon Near series, wherein you play a cold blooded murder machine named Kaim who makes a pact with a dragon to do more killing. Said killing is enacted for gameplay sequences that require excruciating levels of patience to wade through, as hordes of enemies have to be slain with the most unsatisfying weapons imaginable. It is a boring and tedious game to the point of becoming enraging and hypnotic. You begin to associate with Kaim's bloodlust because maybe, just maybe if you keep killing, you'll feel something new. But you never really do, not for long, and that's the point. Dragon Guard wants you to feel miserable. It wants you to be trapped in this loop of feeling like absolute shit accomplishing nothing because everyone in the game feels like shit and wishes to escape that misery through horrible means. But it's meaningless. Everything that happens is meaningless by virtue of being part of some worthless war, one that inadvertently leads to the world being almost irreparably ruined by hypertoxic alien cum. Asui Senka incites, frankly, that exact same feeling of desperation through dopamine deprivation, but uses the language of adult otaku media rather than that of violent 3D action games. It is an onslaught of purposefully boring porn and purposefully boring slice of life featuring characters embodying tired and even arguably harmful tropes, all becoming so generic and repetitive that the characters themselves start to question what the hell it is they're doing. The way this is reflected in Koichi's character is incredibly fascinating. He embodies everything one can point to as to why male protagonists in Edoge aren't particularly memorable. He is flat and expressionless, his dynamics of other characters dull, and the only thing he ever seems to show even vague emotion over are slapstick hijinks with the maids, a character of pleasure during sex, and most curiously, frustration over over his own lack of feeling and interest with the world. Koichi regularly becomes annoyed that nothing seems to make him feel anything and he can't make sense of why that is, as he desperately searches for happiness within the confines of the world and the role he's stuck in. There's a number of moments that showcase this brilliantly, but one of my personal favorites is the event Tenzo no Uta, or Song of the Ceiling. It's listed as being of super hyper importance with fucking 24 point font, but when you play it, it's literally just Koichi staring at a ceiling, remarking how peaceful it is, and then screaming at it. That's it. It's short and curt, it has practically no substance, it has nothing to do with anything that happens in the story, and it's because of all of those things that it manages to capture an all too familiar sense of desperation, a desire for peace to ease a sense of emptiness. Hell, for a chunk of the game, he's hardly even allowed a direct voice in dialogue. Rather than hear his words ourselves, much of what he says is relayed through the filter of characters asking sentences and fragments of them back at him as questions. It is confusing yet vague and only serves to depersonalize 
him further, making it more surprising when he does start speaking. Everything that Goichi stands for as a character is contrasted with his mere informatics and role, Mamoru, the boy who would be heroine and one who takes a suitably confused role in the story as they're made to represent everything a heroine is supposed to be. They're kind, loving, compassionate, and incredibly passive, accepting anything and everything that happens to them as simply part of the course in a story of finding and living with their true love. What makes their dynamics fascinating, however, is how layered their fundamental existences are. In the context of the main narrative, they're star-crossed lovers from different families and bloodlines who complete each other, and they go through that primary narrative never consciously thinking any deeper than that. But the title of the game alone hints at something deeper on a meta level. Suisenka is the Japanese name for the Narcissus flower, named after the Greek fable of falling in love with oneself. That meaning is not at all lost on the narrative, as it's hinted at strongly from the very start that Goichi and Mamoru are not just bonded by roles in a story, but as parts of the same person, connected in some way not known to them. Which then constitutes some of Suisenka's core mysteries. Who really is Mamoru? What's their relation to Koichi? And why have they been chosen as the heroine to his hero? My initial thought about this was that Mamoru is a feminine version of Koichi as some sort of trans allegory, a version of himself that he regrets being lost to time. And while that isn't true, even if the experience of performing the role of another gender merely for a forced narrative is a fucking mood, I do think there's something here of how their dynamic commentates on the way Eroge players often see themselves in heroines rather than heroes. Eroge protagonists, as I've rambled on about many times in the past and even just a moment ago, are often not really interesting as characters. Many of them exist to be swept up in the drama happening in their lives, made simple on purpose both as self-inserts and because male protagonists just often aren't supposed to be interesting. They are templates, stock ideas of men stripped of much beyond what society sees as masculine, strength, a desire to protect, and a sex drive. But as pretty much anyone who isn't grossly misandrist will tell you, men do, in fact, have emotions, and often seem to end up relating to the varied heroines of Eroge stories far more than they do their homogenous heroes, because they are the ones who are allowed to have emotions and story arcs, ironically making them much easier to identify with as people. And similarly, even Koichi's love in the main story feels tinted by this desire to escape the incompleteness of the role of hero, the the role of an emotionally mute man forces onto him. Anything more I could write on the subject of how the influence of stereotypical masculinity results in emotionally blank protagonists has already been done so perfectly by Jesse Gender in her video on the myth of male socialization, so I'll leave it at that for now rather than just copying her words. But I want to mention all of this because I do think Sui Senka's commentary on the subject is incredibly fascinating, and it will come up later in the spoilers section. The dynamic of her primary duo acts as a fascinating contrast to that of Mikado and Sayo, two of the other major players in the plot. While our hero and heroine at least attempt to play a vaguely heartwarming set of roles, that of pure lovers inseparable by time and space, Mikado and her younger sister have no such kind ambitions. The former regularly torments the latter with physical abuse wedged between showers of compliments and affections, and Sayo simply takes it all and keeps her role in this vague. It's their dynamic that highlights another one of Suisenka's greatest strengths in writing, its ability to handle abuse in very sensitive, very familiar ways. Side characters like the two maids stripped of much agency in the story like frightened siblings of an abused child, can't do anything but watch as Sayo is hit and battered. And the few times Koichi can tell Mikado to knock her shit off, she desperately attempts to backpedal and apologize like a scared child while Sayo glances on emotionless. It is deeply uncomfortable and familiar to me as someone who grew up in a neglectful, abusive household, feeling powerless whenever someone other than me was getting hurt. And the way all of this is contextualized later once the meta-narrative takes over, with Fred's involving deep-rooted trauma, parental abuse and neglect is legitimately fascinating. One of the characters who makes that takeover occur is Emi Sakamoto, who quickly rises to importance as something like a deuteragonist. Blunt, thoughtful, and intelligent, it's apparent from the very moment that she's introduced into the story that she is the only character who both understands the world and is allied to Koichi, constantly dropping hints to try and guide him along without explaining everything. She and her rejection of the narrative in pursuit of what she calls an absolute truth are major driving forces behind the game being as great thing as it is. And through some of the few genuinely heartwarming and interesting slice of life scenes, she's shown to be a fascinating, well-rounded person, as capable of sincere affection and care as she is of waxing poetic through purple dialogue and prose. 
If I had to describe the reading experience of Sui Senka, it's somewhere between reading a stage play, a poem, and a visual novel. Prose flows between feeling like Koichi's monologuing and feeling like directions for actors to follow. There's a rhythm and repetition to much of the text that flows like poetry. And on top of that, all of it is formatted perfectly to make each click of the mouse feel momentous. It is a truly unique style that's unlike anything else I've read and a testament to Hayne's skill as a writer. But it's exactly because of this that even despite the game having a shockingly simple vocabulary and even often very parsable grammar, that Sui Senka can be a difficult game to adjust to reading. The shifts between stage direction and monologue, natural as they may be, are still intentionally off-putting and confusing for the sake of the Ludo narrative. Not unlike Drakengard, it gets incredibly hypnotic to read once you get past that curve, but there is still a curve there. That in and of itself is a challenge for any would-be translator, but Sui Senka is also a game where every line of text, even the most dull, feels like it carries some vague, greater implications for a larger universe, and the smallest and subtlest of grammatical and stylistic choices carry immense weight. A perfect example of this is in the use of ruby text. Anytime Mamoru is referred to as a boy, shonen, it's given the hurigana of heroine. Similarly, anytime Koichi is referred to as the protagonist, shujinko, it's given the hurigana of hero. That, alongside a plethora of alternate word readings and even some simple invented terms that create very specific implications, just add to the often flowery, poetic ways things are described, brilliantly wielding features of the Japanese language both complex and simple to achieve a desired atmosphere. You can translate all of that, I'm sure, but if you want to achieve the same fluidity and style, that's another question. Much of what makes Sui Senka enjoyable to read, even its most intentionally dull and exhausting, is that it maintains this impressive level of purplish prose and incredible detail and meaning, while still making the text smooth as silk to parse at a glance without missing anything. Everything feels intentional and considered to achieve that grace and smoothness, even in the most exhausting of slice of life banter and repetitious of erotica, which there is a lot of. In order to commentate on the tonal dissonance often present in adult games in particular, Sui Senka has a massive amount of erotic question mark scenes. On the positive side, all of them have fantastic artwork that's often really aesthetically appealing. There's creative angles and framing and lots of neat positions. In isolation, I think a lot of these illustrations are both creatively rich and just flatly hot. But that's only in isolation because the writing it's coupled with does absolutely everything it can to undermine that eroticism and confuse the reader. Like, in theory, it should be great. Hayne's lavish prose graces every single scene in the game with vivid descriptions. Characters communicate with dialogue that expresses thoughts clearly, and most sequences are pretty long by 2005 Aerogay standards, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes apiece, plenty of time for tension and release. The thing is that Hayne, somehow, in a stroke of brilliance, found the exact way to make all these things incredibly fucking painful. Characters interact with each other as build-up, but it often feels like they have no dynamics, so the sex kinda just comes out of nowhere. The dialogue and prose is detailed, but unnecessarily so, as it drones on and on about the same things for minutes at a time. And though each scene is long, a grand majority of it just feels like it's purposefully wasting your time. Above all that though, there is always this feeling of coercion. All of the sex in this game feels like it happens purely because it's supposed to. Like, why is there a Paizuri scene that not everyone seems to be really enjoying? Because it's supposed to be there. The same reason there's a scene of a girl with a dick masturbating. People who play Aerogay like that, so it should be there, even if it doesn't make sense for her to be doing it in front of someone else. It is some legitimately fascinating commentary on the dissonance that Aerogay can suffer from from, where erotic scenes can come out of nowhere and contribute little to the story. While I do have complicated feelings on that topic as someone who both does not see random sex as worse than, I don't know, slice of life filler, and believes too many people are quick to demean adult content on no grounds greater than it's icky, there is a legitimate issue in the genre of adult scenes being used poorly and without regards to characters' personalities. Asui Senka brings this to light by allowing the characters to be at least somewhat conscious of the narrative they're stuck in. They have the agency to question why these acts are obligatory, and to feel something other than pleasure. Koichi, in particular, often remarks through monologue his frustration over not enjoying what's happening. And in one particular scene, he has a moment where he realizes he's doing this merely to fulfill the expectations of a story, before promptly snapping back into it, losing that lucidity. It all adds up to a fascinating portrayal of what it feels like to engage with sex not out of a genuine interest in the act, but as an obligation due to greater pressure. And Koichi being the main one to bring this to light is fascinating to me, because men, especially cis men, are often assumed by many societies to be always interested in sex, and to not be as a sign of weakness. The key thing to being masculine is, well, essentially not being perceived as feminine. Do you know what happens to be stereotypically considered feminine with regard to sex? 
having low desire. So, what does being manly look like with regard to sexual desire? It means the antithesis of low desire. A real man would never have a low interest in sex, because failing to initiate sexual activity or show a strong interest in sex can call into question a man's masculinity and even his sexual orientation. Koichi is thrust into the role of hero and told to embody this. <laughs> Thrust <laughs> sex. <laughs> Each and every single one of the scenes involving him feels like the act is being performed out of an obligation. As not only a man, but a male protagonist, it is his duty to enjoy sex like this. But much like many of the real men socialized in this hypersexual way, something always feels wrong to Koichi. By purposefully making these scenes as mind-numbing and frustrating to read as possible, Hain manages to validate those struggles and show on a personal level how that obligation feels. It captures what many men feel, and I know that at least a bit because it's something I personally experienced before transition when I was still putting on that mask. That messaging that people perceived as men should be sexually available at all times is everywhere and overwhelming. And even now, having accepted myself as a trans woman and lived as such for the last three years, I still feel tings of guilt and confusion when I find myself not in a mood or disinterested in someone or something, thanks to a mixture of both sexual trauma and the programming of those assumptions. Whether Hain intended or not to represent those feelings that many people feel, not just cis straight men, but many ace people of all genders, and really anyone, is something I don't know for sure. But even if it only does this for the sake of literary criticism, Suisenka is still one of the only pieces of Japanese media, really media period, I've seen that engages with this to any extent. In a more thematic sense, however, these segments become powerful contemplations on not only the dissonance particular to Eroge, but the broader problem in fiction writing of characters performing actions purely out of obligation to plot and tropes, rather than things that make sense for them. It's a concept that becomes increasingly important as the game goes on, and is also important to its discussions of abuse. The game regularly challenges the player's role in their harm of these characters through making you see the consequences of choosing to engage with these scenes of coercion. By choosing to see this narrative, which reduces the complicated people of the meta-narrative into mere tropes and parts of roles for a story, you are an active part of hurting these characters and pushing them into situations they'd rather not be in, merely for your own pleasure. The scene which addresses this most explicitly, and it's the only one that really comes close to actually showing explicit sexual assault, comes late in the game. One day, the abuse against Silo reaches a boiling point as Mikado pins her to the dinner table with the rest of the cast frozen in place, unable to do anything as if bound by invisible chains as Mikado wields a knife and prepares the gorge of the younger sister. And before it begins proper, Mikado addresses Koichi, and by extension the player by telling them no matter what, they cannot look away from this, because they chose to watch this. It was their conscious decision to engage with an event of abuse for their amusement. Though the scene doesn't show anything visually graphic as it stops short of Sayo being wounded, it is still one of the most viscerally uncomfortable for how it builds tension with no release, only upended by Koichi being physically unable to handle it anymore and disassociating from the story. Not unlike how someone might skip a scene that's too painful or simply quit a game. The whole, ooh, the player is the baddie, ooh, concept is one of the most overdone with meta storytelling these days, but I think the fact that Sui Senka's meta narrative occurs in universe adds some much needed complexity. Rather than be a simple and frankly misplaced criticism of people for enjoying problematic media, and instead taps into Sui Senka's larger commentary on knowingly stripping people and characters of agency for a story. It's one thing to write a story that's weird and depraved as hell, that I personally approve of and encourage, but what I feel Sui Senka addresses is how it's kind of fucked up to knowingly ignore the feelings of people and strip them of their agency just to force them to play the roles you want them to in your story. And by making the player the one to enact the story, through choosing which nodes you want to engage with, many nodes you don't even have to engage with, you become an active and knowing participant in that charade. It feels dirty, like you're forcing people to do things they don't want to. Hain somehow manages to weave all of that in some way wilder shit together into a story that never feels like it shifts style for even a second. The writing is always full of a consistent personality, even as the contents of the story metamorphosize from narrative into meta-narrative, a subconscious confusion over the world morphing into outright rebellion and lamentation. I already mentioned Tenjo no Uta earlier, but even that just feels like barely scratching the surface of how fucking bizarre this game gets. 
That event is part of a larger branch called Daily Life, which starts like a mimicry of Slice of Life anime until Amy's conversations in the events, well, effectively therapy sessions, start getting the Koichi. Her talking about some mysterious past we can only guess at, presumably to do with Mamoru, slowly starts cracking him until he just walks out to the courtyard one day and starts laughing at everything. And the next day it's the ceiling, and then eventually he walks out into literal nothingness and all you hear is laughing and clapping as he's breaking down, and then it's over. It is remarkable how well the game drip feeds you these moments of tantalizing hints at deeper elements in the story, occasionally interrupted by events that are less of subtle hints and more like the Titanic hitting the iceberg. A case in point, the early game event titled True Ending. A special emphasis on it merely being titled that because it's actually not the true ending at all. What it is instead is the logical conclusion of the interior narrative, a heartfelt conclusion to a pure love tale, which sees Mamoru and Koichi getting together as Mikado and Sayo celebrate the arrival of a pure world world that they strive for. Happy end for all! Except, you also have Amy suffering from a breakdown as she laments Koichi's inability to escape and wake up from the narrative, wondering if he's perhaps happier for living in a lie of a world, in a mere story. It seems in plot threads like this that the reason I framed this video around the whole creepypasta thing like I have. Sui Senka really captures the kind of story self-awareness I loved in those as a kid, and uses that to explore a whole host of creative themes. I've already hinted enough about how it deals with narratives as a form of violence, control, and traps, but Amy's part in this event showcases something else important, a sense of profound loss and grief. And of course, being that this is a game I'm covering, that extends out to being about trauma. Sui Senka deals very aptly with the ways that it traps individuals in broken, repeating stories, unable to craft any sort of narrative for ourselves, and how it leads to ourselves fracturing and living lives like Koichi, as people who feel empty, dull, desperate for emotion and to escape a monochrome world into something more beautiful and vibrant. The fakeness of the vibrancy that Goichi finds within that narrative is something I feel the art manages to capture brilliantly, as expected from the talents of Sapporo Momoko. Though best known for her numerous visual novel scores like Sayonara Oshite, as well as most recently Geminism, she is a damn talented artist as well, most vividly apparent here in the CGs. Many of them feature overwhelming, vivid lighting that feels soft yet abrasive at the same time, real yet exaggeratedly fake. It not only captures the feeling of dissonance and surreality that defines Sui Senka's story, and themes, but it adds to the unique feel of the writing that I described earlier. Everything feels like it's being performed on a stage with these garish spotlights cast on characters, yet they're all up close and personal like you would expect from Edoge CGs. Even the way characters are represented in normal dialogue sequences feels just slightly off. Rather than go for the normal VN style of full body or torso up standing sprites, characters are represented with close up shots and the sprite of the character primarily focused on in the background. It gives this odd feeling of immediacy to everything. Rather than be distanced from the characters, you are forced to stand right next to them as Koichi does. It's a unique decision that adds to the sensation of the game being somewhere between a stage play and visual novel, implemented carefully enough not to lose anything that a more typical approach brings. Each character feels expressive in unique ways with a whole gamut of expressions, or lack thereof when suitable, to convey with images the mood and atmosphere of a situation better than words can. Even the UI has this feeling of being in a liminal space, caught between the lavish interfaces of the PC-98 era and the more simplified design of the Windows era. The HUD is decadent and gold-plated with fonts that feel bizarrely modern for the otherwise old European aesthetic of the game, equally apparent in the way backgrounds are shown through a small security camera-like window overlaid onto a map of the manor with scan lines. It feels fake and artificial. It has all the elements of something like an affluent manor, but it's interrupted by modern flourishes and clear signs that it's not what it's pretending to be, elements layered on top of something greater. It's some incredible weaving of the story's themes and vibes into the subtlest of places on Momoko's part, and something I didn't even think about until writing all this. I'd be mistaken to talk about the art of the game without mentioning the quality of the designs as well. Everyone, besides Koichi, looks lavish and decadent in ways that mix very well with Momoko's kinda 2000s moe, kinda 90s anime style. Mamoru's truly incredible casual drip, Mikado's gaudy dress, Amy's genderous fuck suit and tie, it's all very memorable and reflective of each cast member's personality. There's respect that has to be given as well for Amy being one of the exceedingly rare black anime characters characters that's actually black, not a villain, not a walking stereotype, or written off as just tan. Also, can we talk about the main menu for a second? Because this has to be one of the best I've ever seen. It feels almost hostile the first time you play, a massive sprawl of boxes that all start from one place, buttons that seem to do nothing, a preview window filled with static as white as snow until you make a scene selection, a complete lack of audio besides a few sound effects, and descriptions that are vague, poetic, and daunting. 
both in writing and difficulty of reading. If there is anything that makes Sui Senka functionally hard to parse simply as a player, it's sadly the resolution. Being that this was released in the mid-2000s when 800 by 600 was a premium for Edoge and 640 by 40 was the norm, Sui Senka runs at the ladder and really suffers from it in places. The menu screen font borders on unreadable at multiple points due to kanji blending together into a mush of brush strokes, and the ruby text in the text box can suffer from this too. I'm not normally someone who complains about resolution, hell, I'll take crispy free 20 by 200 pixel art over photorealistic jaggy free 4k graphics any day, but Sui Senka's is downright an accessibility problem only vaguely alleviated by modern scaling programs like Magpie. Before anyone comments, oh man, and you know, it's just made for CRTs, it was perfectly readable on CRTs, yeah, no, no. No, that, 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 that is made for ants. And besides that, I just really wish it was possible to see Momoko's work in a higher resolution. She is one hell of a talented illustrator just as much as she is a talented musician. Sui Senka's score is, without any doubt in my mind, the absolute best Seppuro Momoko has ever composed. As much as I adore her work on other titles, and particularly on Sayonara Oshite, Sui Senka's is in another league with its instrumentation, production, composition, brilliant use of leitmotif, and remarkable ability to capture the tone of the story. Tracks like Eien no Shoujo capture the feeling of emptiness and sadness that's omnipresent within the narrative. It's as slow and reflective as it is melancholic, embodying the tragedy of Goichi and Mama whose characters that become apparent as the story progresses. I particularly love its use of exclusively digital tones. Everything from the upright bass to the infamous ice rain sound present on many synthesizers all clearly comes from some assortment of synths, adding a sense of artificiality to the whole thing. Contrast that with something like Hirui, which incorporates those along with samples of chaotic violin playing into one beautifully dissonant, uncomfortable piece that feels as if it's in constant anxiety. Or on the complete flip side, you have the few tracks used for the more comedic sections of the game, which, like the writing, feel as if they're trying far too hard to create an atmosphere of jest that no one is responsive to. And of course, I can't talk about Sui Senka's music without mentioning what is effectively the main theme of the game, Sui Sen no Kimi. It encapsulates everything the game represents, from a melancholy over the past to the hopes for a future worth living, all in a piece that bounces from hauntingly simple to dense with distorted electronic percussion and overlapping counter melodies. It is the single best piece of music in the game, and one that, whenever it plays, you know is signaling something incredible. Also, I don't have much in particular to say about the track literally titled Sui Senka, other than it's a bop and I need people to listen to it. This is some Umi Neko ass music. The placement of the score in the game deserves praise, too. Besides one or two incidents of the music feeling unintentionally ill-fitting, the score is always used brilliantly to contribute to the atmosphere of a scene, even being excluded in many places to induce a sense of unease or suspense. The scripting as a whole in the game really is fantastic. Likewise, the voice acting is great as each seiyu really seem to get their respective characters, like Moriyama Aoi providing a subdued yet nervous tone to Mamoru, or Sakura Reona playing heavy into the killer beauty side of Mikado's character. Out of the cast, though, my favorite has to be Okogawa Kumiko as Amy. Her ability to shift from subdued and intellectual to a full emotional breakdown in seconds is legitimately remarkable, and I was caught off guard multiple times by how powerful her performance is. <laughs> Nara, 
She's also maybe the only somewhat known member of the cast, having appeared in multiple Alice Soft games, Baldur's Sky, and personal favorite, Shinya Kukimi. It kind of surprised me to find out that damn near none of these VAs got much work or notoriety following this title, since all of them really put every bit of effort they could into their performances to some fantastic end results. And speaking of the end, I think it's finally time that we close up the spoiler free section, dive deep into the greater story, and explore what all of these disparate elements add up to in the end. The metafiction, the subtle horror, the collapsing of reality, the fractured nature of trauma, the ways in which narrative can become our savior as it does our downfall, all adding up together into basically the creepypasta game of Eroge. While I won't be diving into every aspect of the game, as there is just far too much for any one singular person to cover, I will still be going over some major themes and twists, so if you want to avoid spoilers, then I'd recommend skipping ahead to the ending segment where I summarize my thoughts and give a final verdict. But before that, let's take a moment to thank all the patrons, donors, and everyone else who makes this possible, as well as shout out some cool people that you should check out. Hello everyone, happy holidays, and if you're watching this on YouTube and not early on Patreon, welcome to the first Patreon break of 2024. It's that time of the video to give life and channel updates, shoutouts, and appreciate all the patrons and other donors that make content like this possible. First, thank you all so much for making 2023 as amazing as it was. Not only has the channel exploded in popularity far beyond what I could have imagined, but I'm beyond thrilled to say that the income from Patreon is not only strong enough for me to have a stable living above the poverty line just off of it, allowing me to live much more comfortably than I was even a few months ago, where taking on side gigs was basically a necessity to live and have any sort of extra income, but that it's enough for me to finally, seriously, really start investing in things to slowly improve this channel. The first step towards that, as I'm sure you've noticed, Notice with me appearing in this video more is getting an actual nice camera. I've been wanting to do it for a while and following shooting for the Sex 2 video being a freaking nightmare, I used a lot of the money I'd been saving from sponsors and music commission work to buy a Canon R50 with lens. And man, holy crap has it made working on this video so much easier. Having much finer control over the camera and everything from focal length to aperture, as well as the camera just actually looking good, has made filming far less exhausting and frustrating. I hope to keep getting lots of use out of it starting from here, especially as I aim towards saving for lighting, a 50mm lens for filming myself nicer, a decent tripod, and all that other crap you suddenly start needing when you get a camera. Also, seriously, just being able to film myself makes production so much easier so I don't have to find like 500 clips for something. I cannot express enough how happy I am to be at a point where I can start considering the idea of using money to visibly improve the content that y'all get to watch, beyond just my skills at editing and writing improving. Because besides all of that to make the video part of the video more appealing, I'm also hoping that in 2024 I can finally start looking at actually paying people to assist with these videos. Not with editing or writing or gathering footage because how I go about all that is deeply personal to me. I don't want the very personal core of this content to change, but I would really like to hire artists for thumbnails and artwork, voice actors for reading out quotes, translators for translating passages, things that I feel would improve this content as well as support really awesome friends and colleagues. On that note, I want to say thank you again to everyone who has lent support in these regards. Len with their art like in the Jisatsu video thumbnail, Castell of proofreading, translating, suggestions, and just a whole bunch of other stuff, for Nan and Hikari in this video with their voices, and all of the other awesome people who've contributed over the years. And another thank you to everyone who donates this channel. I hope 2024 is a year of constant growth and improvement, not just in numbers, but in quality and how much more of a community work these videos can become. And to give back to the community that makes all of this possible, I would like to take a moment to shout out some cool people from my ongoing Twitter thread of neat creators, my Tumblr inbox, and just neat peeps that I know. And if you too would like a chance to be shouted out, then drop me a line in the thread, at me on Twitter, or drop an ask on Tumblr. I am always looking for cool new people to shout out. The first person I'd like to shout is James Makepeace, who has both a super cool band camp and the focus of this shout out, a channel named Kai After Kai, where they create videos on a whole variety of topics. But the one that intrigued me the most is their video on the Bag of Milk games, which is an incredibly well put together, stylistically unique dive into some really damn cool titles. The video is sharply edited, simple but with flair, the script is well written and clear, concise but verbose without fluff, and they make some fascinating commentary on the themes of the games, both in terms of what they mean by themselves and connecting them with their own life and feelings. It's everything I look for in a video essay. It's smartly critical and does a great examination, but is also deeply personal, engaging with art as, you know, a personal extension of yourself. The fact they don't have more views is seriously criminal, and I highly encourage all of you to check out that video along with their other works if you at all enjoy mine. They've got some killer music on Bandcamp, I've enjoyed all of their essays they've made that I've watched, and the dude is just stylish as fuck. 
The second person I want to shout out is Faraway Times, who's got a cool Itch.io page full of games. Some tiny, some less tiny, but all neat and cool. I played a few for this video, like Atop the Witch's Tower, a really cute super short game made in ZZT about two girls opening up to each other, which was heartwarming. I played Breathless as well, which is some very effective and clever twine horror with sharp and pointed prose. And I also played Engorged, which is environmentalist blob horror? It's, it's actually pretty cool. Everything I played showcases a serious talent for pacing and making the most out of short run times. At less than 10 minutes a game on average, you can really just devour a ton of them and get something neat out of each experience. A bunch of quirky little things that leave you smiling, unnerved, confused, fulfilled, and everything in between. It's all neat stuff that makes me smile, knowing people are still making cute little things for the sake of making cute little things. And with those people hopefully pulled up in other tabs to check out after this, I would also like to take a moment to answer some Patreon Q&As before wrapping up. So let's go! Habibi asks, speaking of well-developed main characters like Goichi, who's an Edoge MC on the opposite end of the spectrum that you can't stand? The protagonist of Shizuku is the only one that really comes to mind. Also, Kasuri Hitoshi and Parfait is a little bitch boy who can't handle women having experience. Fucking coward. Rand asks, how do you generally feel about adaptations and tie-in games for visual novels? I think a lot of them suffer from the same issues that all adaptations can, amplified by the additional and often failed challenge of adapting a non-linear story into a linear show, but there's still some great ones out there like Fate 2014. Maddie Hunter asks, I was wondering if you've ever heard of Inga Oho, Murderous Plaza. I have not, and apparently it did in fact never come out, but the studio's other games look neat, so I'd like to look more into those. They also said, I was wondering if you would ever consider covering the Data Live series. Potentially. I only know it because I think some of the girls are super fucking cute, but maybe it could be a project over the course of 2024? There's a lot of content. Livy94 asks, It's not PC98, but I'm curious what you think about Radical Dreamers on the Satella view. I never played it or Chrono Trigger, but I really want to, so maybe that's also a 2024 video? Horai asks, Could you talk about Isaku at some point? It's definitely in the cards, but I'd like to discuss the larger Saku series since there isn't too much to write about Isaku by itself. Klob asks, Have you ever heard of the game Sanzen Sekai Yugi? I have not, but what the fuck? This looks cool. Y'all know some really neat games. That is definitely something I'm going to look more into. Bay asks, do you produce any music outside of games? As well as, what got you into producing music? I mean, I make little bits here and there, but it is mostly for games because it's time consuming and after work, I usually just read manga or watch anime or something else relaxing. As for what got me into making music, I got really into old computers and sound hardware at one point, stumbled into the tools that made it possible to make music for the old AdLib sound card for IDM compatibles, and it's history from there. Peter Tashar asks, what are your thoughts on machine translations? Bad. I could write an entire essay on it and probably will at some point, but the long and fast is I don't think machines are capable of understanding the human intricacies of prose and writing, or even capable of understanding basic fucking grammar should be a part of any professional or amateur product, and only very sparingly used for research. It's acceptable for cursory glances, but if you're gonna cite something in another language in your video or essay or published academic article, please ask for help or pay a translator. And with all that said, I think it's about time to wrap things up. Again, I really want to thank everyone who makes this possible. All of my donors who keep me going, all the people who leave wonderful comments, all the viewers who view viewingly <laughs> and leave likes and share things around and all that stuff. Each and every one of you makes this possible, and I cannot overstate how grateful I am for that. And if you want to help keep me afloat, making these videos and improving them, then consider donating monthly via Patreon or Ko-fi or one time via the latter. In exchange, you'll get access to uncut videos, often early access, your name in the corner with the other cool peeps, the ability to ask me questions, suggest game status updates, and maybe some other neat things, all for as little as one dollar a month. No benefits are locked behind any tiers, you can give as little or as much as you want and give all the same. Hell, I'd set it lower than a US dollar if Patreon will let me, but they don't, which is fucking frustrating. But if you can't donate, that's okay too. Just leaving comments, likes, sharing these videos around, subscribing and all that other cool stuff is really important too and means a ton. I'm just happy to see people enjoying what I make because what I want more than anything is just that. It means the world to me to see people say my videos help them through hard times or make them feel heard or really anything like that. It's just, I don't know, it makes me happy, man. I can't really imagine doing anything other than this right now or even in the far future. This is just, it's just nice. But with all that said, I think it's time to get to the other half of this video. So, Again, thank you all, and let's get back to the show. 
Before I continue on, I feel that it's important to both give a recap of the core beats of Sui Sanka's narrative and to tie together all the assorted things I've set up to this point. Because as I've stated many times, the first two thirds of the game are disparate, to put it lightly. The flowchart feels like a collection of vague yet overly detailed memories that fail to collect into anything coherent, strung together only by a constant sense of loss, emptiness, and frustration. And during all of this, there's a couple things that stand out. Obviously, there's Koichi's struggles to stay within the narrative, as well as the constant hints towards him and Mamoru's deeper connection. There's Mikado's constant theatrics, how she speaks of the story like the director of a tragic play. There's the maid's seeming unawareness of everything. And then, there's the way Amy acts distinctly different from all the other characters, aware of the underpinnings of the world. Where this all comes into fruition is late into the game. One fateful night, Sayo's voice leads Koichi down a dimly lit corridor towards Mikado's room, who's seen talking with Amy in vague terms. She declares that Amy's role in this story has ended, and starts scolding her for her inability to wish for a happy story with her. But Amy stays firm in the resolve that what she's seeking, the truth, is correct. After Koichi goes to bed, unsure what to make of it all, he wakes to go to the breakfast table and finds something mysterious. An empty seat where a certain someone should have been. A certain young heroine that no one else remembers except for Amy. Surprised by Koichi's sudden awareness of the way the story has changed from under him, she immediately takes him back to his room, soon after leaving the manor for the forest where all of this started. It's there, after gathering the resolve to stay on a path of truth no matter the pains, that Amy helps him to wake up to something he should have accepted long ago. After spending the entire game in denial every time he's presented with the possibility, desperate to avoid the truth in his past, he accepts that though he is Koichi, our protagonist, our hero, he is also my Amaru, our heroine, our princess, and a fragment of his being that he lost long ago. It is only with this, after waking from the shock of the realization, that he is truly able to answer to his identity and escape the narrative. This is the moment where my jaw did a cosmic slam dunk onto the floor. It is the moment where Koichi, after struggling for so long, after suffering so goddamn much, finally breaks free of the narrative and reaches the same level as the players. He realizes that he can no longer run from the truth, and in quite possibly one of the greatest moments of interaction in visual novel history, you are the one who shatters the illusion with your bare mouse button. And no matter what name you enter, you cannot change the result because Koichi knows that he is not the male protagonist. He is not the self-insert. He is Oyagi Koichi and no one else. I legitimately started screaming in excitement when I reached this part. It marks the turning point in Sui Senka's narrative where the game goes from painfully dull scenes with hints towards something greater to a full-on metafiction thrill ride that is near impossible to put down, paced brilliantly to keep the reader on the edge of their seat waiting for the next reveal. Which thankfully doesn't take long, as Koichi gathers the resolve to tell Amy that he not only wants to know what's happening, but that he must. The nature of the world, what she's aiming for, and most importantly of all, the past that's been torturing him which he understands so little of. Why he's connected to everyone here, why he's in this story, and particularly what's happened with Mamoru. By Amy's recollection, the past is as follows. Long ago, there was a woman by the name of Hibiki, mother of not only Koichi, but Mikado and Sayo as well, the latter two at the least under different fathers. Though she once lived in happiness with a man as hero and heroine of a story, their story ended. Time went on, and what was once a beautiful, simple narrative changed. The roles altered from under them, their rights as hero and heroine stripped, and she grieved the loss. It was in that grief that she committed a sin. She rewrote the story herself so she could once again be heroine, warping and tainting it with a curse that doomed everyone to suffering. Her youngest daughter, Sayo, was verbally and physically abused. Her eldest daughter, Mikado, was neglected, growing up desperate to be given any attention. And the oldest of the three, her only son, Mamoru, was kissed like a lover by her in a desperate bid to reclaim the pure love which the story and time now denied her. We learn in a future event that this is the reason why Mamoru exists as a separate entity from Koichi. The event 
then traumatized him. Not just the act of abuse itself, but the framing of it too. Hibiki claimed that even if he didn't understand it now, he would look back fondly on it as a testament to an untainted love that crossed all boundaries, even those of family and blood. Unable to deal with the pain, the confusion, and the fear, Mamoru wished to simply stop existing. He wanted to push all of that sadness away, down into something that could be discarded. He locked his entire existence up to that point away. And from that moment, Mamoru was frozen in time with a new character born, Koichi Oyagi, a shell of a man who would embody the role of a hero, taking on this role solely to live in a narrative that would allow him to escape from his past and feel nothing. It's through all of this that we finally learn what Mikado's role in the story is as well. As hinted at multiple times in the narrative, she is indeed the mastermind behind the story of Suisenka. Unable to cope with the severe neglect from her mother and seething with jealousy towards Sayo for at least being noticed by her by way of abuse, she chose to try and escape from it all, warping the world to fit her needs in a way she believed could lead to happiness, just like her mother did. That is its own can of thematic worms that I'll get to in time, but I want to take a moment to talk about Koichi's particular response to trauma and how brilliantly this twist with him and Mamoru is pulled off. While I had guessed when playing that their fracturing had something to do with some major event, I didn't at all guess this in particular despite it making complete sense. The refusal to recall their past, the fragmentation of their personalities, and most particularly Koichi and Mamoru's apprehension and confusions with sex all make a lot of sense when you realize that both of them are still struggling to understand and accept the sexual abuse that had been done to them. And if there's any one scene that I feel captures all of this in retrospect, it's one from the prologue where Mamoru is talking to Kanae, one of the maids, and Koichi listens in. Kanae talks about her wishes for a caring family, having grown up in one which severely abused her. Mamoru's response to this is a confused sadness, unable to understand the concept of family, yet earnest wishing for it, and even seeming a bit happy when Kanae lets him call her an older sister. Koichi's response, however, is almost enraged confusion. The mere mention of family, the way that Mamoru seems to actually have found some care, seems to trigger some sort of pain in him that he can't understand. That scene is Koichi being faced with a past version of himself, one that is still living within that trauma and confusion, and in response to seeing that, he begins collapsing without understanding why, trying to find any reason to explain it. Despite locking all of it down deep inside him in hopes that it would go away, wishing it to exist in a being wholly separate from him, all of those pains and feelings are still there because you can't escape trauma as easily as forgetting it. The only way in which Goichi is truly able to begin moving on and reconciling with the world he's trapped in is to accept that past as a part of his life and himself. And move on he does, even as characters begin disappearing from a narrative one by one. Amy departs understanding that she can't do anything more for Koichi and that he has to finish this on his own. Kanae is shot dead by Mikado after attempting to depart for her own story and being denied such a right. And the other maid, Yuko, disengages from it all, admitting that she knew everything happening yet chose to live her simple life instead. This leaves us only with Koichi, who's escaped from the narrative and is ready to push forward to the future. And the two sisters, Mikado and Sayo, who arrive at Koichi's office with a surprise. She reveals to him Mamoru, reconstructed as a shell of a person, a stuffed doll as a the narration describes it, in one last ditch effort to rub Koichi back into the narrative of pure love she'd been spinning. But rather than accept this, he, and Sayo and Mamoru with him, reject all of it, leading Mikado to fall into silence as Koichi reconciles with his past self. Mamoru can't understand why Koichi can't simply live in the pure, beautiful narratives given to him. To them, a traumatized part of Koichi that feels left behind, there's no reason why one shouldn't embrace this. A world of pleasure, of carefree life, and of escape from a reality that's more than willing to trample on people's purity and innocence like had happened to them. But for Koichi, he sees that avoidance as foolish. Stories are merely fiction. Even if living in the world may mean living with no ending in sight, even if it is devoid of blessings, even if it is full of deception and struggles, he must go forward accepting those things and see the stories he's been shown as cherished, fictive ideals and nothing more. Because though there is no such thing as a perfect world and though life cannot be simplified into a story with meaning, it still has meaning meaning so as long as we know that we exist. Just as Mamoru struggles to accept this, so too does Mikado, though for even more complicated reasons. Because what truly broke her in the past wasn't only the neglect, but what she saw when Hibiki kissed Mamoru. It wasn't grief at having abused her own child, it wasn't pain, it wasn't horror, it was joy. A burst of laughter as she felt she had finally found true love which crossed all boundaries.
boundaries. A horrible sin committed for the sake of her true ending. A happy conclusion to her story and hers alone at the cost of hurting other people. It's seeing that joy, which Mikado had been denied all her life, which she could never obtain because of her mother's sins that destroyed her. It's what led her to single-mindedly pursue crafting the story titled Sui Senka, repeating it over and over again, desperately searching for the pure love her mother felt. Which leads Koichi to ask her, what does she hope to get out of this? What does she hope to gain from fooling herself and living in yet another story, when living for a narrative is what hurt her, her mother, and everyone else? For Mikado, there is no way to live but this. She wants to live in this and even defends it. After all, what's wrong with wanting to exist in this beautiful world when reality is full of cruelty? And furthermore, what about everything in this story? Pure love, carefree days, promises of internal joy, bountiful sex, a perfect heroine, and amazing sight characters, is this not the ideal life which only exists in writing in fiction? Why would anyone want this to end? This is where I want to call back to the box of the game. Remember how I said it was important? Well, have you noticed these two girls on the front, and have you noticed them anywhere in the game? No? Well, that's because they're not here. This box is a lie. In fact, this whole box, which I've taped over a sticky note so I don't have to do more motion graphics for censoring, is filled with advertising blurbs that exaggerate and misrepresent features, but these girls are probably the most clear example of that. In one of the very few moments of explicit fourth wall breaking in this game, these girls are only here because they're a part of what Mikado had just been saying. They're elements one expects from this story, thoughtlessly and uncritically added merely to attract people. A meaningless aspect of a meaningless story turned out for others' sake, no different from all the other pretty, personalityless girls in narratives similarly devoid of purpose as the narrative of Sui Senka. All of the most boring, dull, generic aspects of this game exist simply because Mikado believes that an escape lies somewhere within this narrative. That if she repeats these same, tired, otaku, eroge stories enough times, that she'll find happiness within them eventually, all without reflection or growth. With that same conviction, however, Goichi continues to reject all of it in favor of living in this cruel, complicated reality, something that eventually breaks Mikado's spirit and the story alike. Though the tale is over, Sayo promises that one still exists within the skies above. And in order to find that story, Sayo commits one final act for the sake of her and her sister with the last two rounds in her gun. A double suicide as the two, unable to accept the world for what it is, reject life in the hopeless search of a narrative where they can find only happiness. Thus, we're brought to the final scene of the game. Goichi, with his will resolved, moves forward to live his life, both embodying and leaving behind all this story has woven, including Mamoru. Holding a gun to their own head, the two exchange the words they should have long ago as they accept what they mean to each other. With permission from Koichi to pull the trigger and bring the curtains down, Mamoru gives one final message. <laughs> けれど。I think it's in this scene that Sui Senka's ultimate message is made clear. To live is to both accept your past and to kill it. To live is to accept the world for the impure, painful thing that it is, and use stories only to remind ourselves of the beauty that exists within it, lest we become trapped living for them and in them. And most of all, it is that to live is to escape that need for a narrative in our lives, to escape the idea that we must be a certain thing and embrace life for the beautiful chaos that it is. 
While I feel everyone is going to relate to this concept in a different way, as the pressure to conform to a role in society is one of the most universally shared pains among people, but also one of the most varied and complicated, it's my experiences living as a trans woman that I personally connected with it the most. Because a major part of the trans experience, at least for many of us who did not grow up in incredibly accepting homes with incredibly accepting friend groups and such, is deviating from the narratives that society has set for us. We grow up with people expecting us to play certain roles, to be certain people, to lead certain lives, and then one day we up and leave all of that to pursue something far different, often the exact opposite. And though the expectations that the narratives of normalcy give affect everyone strongly, I feel this identity almost gives us a double impact sometimes. For me, there was this inescapable feeling of wrongness, both that the typical role of a strong, cool guy who'd grow up to have a wife and kids felt incorrect to me as a person, but also that I was wrong for not desiring it because being a guy sounded wrong. So when the time finally came for me to transition at the age of 19, socially and medically, it wasn't what medication would do to me or how people would react that scared me the most. Though I feared those things, it was really the idea that the narrative that I had built, that had been built for me, was going to be destroyed. That the second I embraced what I felt was the right identity, the second I took that medication, was the second that I irreversibly broke the narrative I'd been forced to conform to and that seemed to have an entire life laid out for me. Get a job, get a woman, get a house, get kids. The second I became a woman in the eyes of other people who'd known me before, that all vanished into chaos and even if I wanted to go back to that narrative, well, I did something that broke it. Like I said, I didn't like that story. It was never my story to tell, but the fact it was the only one I had laid out made it scary to escape. The fact it existed at all was a sense of comfort because I didn't know what life was going to be like as a trans woman. I knew what narratives were expected of women, but I didn't know if I could lead any of those or if I'd even want to lead any of those. And of course, much as they may have not been the number one fears, I still dreaded the immediate impact and it turns out I wasn't wrong for doing so. People had all these expectations of me and they were quick to say how upset they were of me for choosing a path in my life that required them to rethink my life and the stories they had built for me. They wanted me to be a certain character and not being so was enough reason to enact cruelty. Gaslighting, suicide frets, verbal abuse, misgendering, dead naming, anything and everything out of pure confusion that someone could be something different than they wanted them to be. I feel Sui Senka really does capture this feeling with its whole theme of narrative as violence. Mikado attempts to weave a world to make others happy and instead traps them in a place where no growth can occur. And when growth does occur outside of it, outside of that narrative, when there is a desire to be someone other than the role given, she becomes outraged and begins lashing out at him, desperate to cling onto the comfort she found in her narratives. Even beyond that, there is this persistent sense in the writing that almost no one is happy with the role they've been given. Saiho is trapped as the token quiet girl, unable to do anything but accept the abuse that made her this way. Kanae is trapped as a side character, not allowed to have a past or future despite wanting to live her own life. Mamoru is empty, a husk of a person who exists to fulfill a narrative need. And Koichi, for much of the story, captures what it feels like to try and force oneself into the mold of a typically masculine man, by so many standards. By forcing himself to be the male protagonist, the blank slate that so many men are sold as an ideal of strength, he suffers at every turn, unable and refusing to confront the past that's muted his emotions. And because of that, nothing can bring him joy, but he can't voice it because it's not his role to. Only when he breaks free from that stereotypical assigned role can he become a whole person. Sui Senka, by choosing to convey its themes through a greater meta-narrative, where actors are forced to live in roles not unlike how our world forces people to live in roles, gives characters a voice that allows the meta-narrative to show how these reductive narratives we force upon people in reality into our own characters and writing can be forms of violence. These roles of strong silent men, of passive dainty women, of silent abuse victims, of simple happy aids to the rich, erase the complexity of individual people and systems, boiling them down to nothing but digestible concepts for a mass market. A mass market that, by design, wants to perpetuate these roles so it can continue to erase history and force people to live dull, boring lives that are effective for production. But where I think Sui Senka takes this a step further and gets incredibly fascinating is in how it goes as far as to say that all forms of narrative have the potential to cause harm for ourselves and others. Not just in how we force people into roles and assert that they stay within those roles, but that attempting to form narratives for life is an innately dangerous ordeal simply because life itself 
cannot be distilled that way. That's demonstrated through the handful of normal endings that are contained within the game. They aren't requirements to reach the true ending of the meta narrative, but I feel they're really important for how they hammer in the idea that there is no such thing as one narrative for life that can make everyone happy. I've already touched on the false true ending, which acts as a what if situation where Mamoru and Koichi fail to escape the narrative of Suisenka and live together, presumably trapped forever in the same misery they've been in since the start of the game. Mikado gets one as well, which sees Sayo killing only herself and Mikado going to the forest to bring her back and restart the narrative all over again. Another attempt to find joy within another story. But it's Amy's that sticks with me the most. Rather than disappear as she does in the final ending, she stays around. Though this seems to be short-lived as Mikado tries to kill her and Amy is seemingly resurrected as a nameless maid, punished for the sin of being a side character who loved the protagonist, which brings up some interesting implications about the other nameless maids, she shows up in the end to kill Mikado, our supposed villain, and meet with the freshly resurrected Mamoru. Giving Sayo's pistol as a present to the heroine and telling them to pursue their own life, Amy walks off confidently, remarking that she is Amy Sakamoto, the protagonist of her own story. While this at first seems like a good ending, Mikado and Sayo are defeated, everyone else lives, Femboy's got a gun, it too enacts violence. By pursuing her Shinjitsu or pure truth, Amy ironically fails to account for complexities that even she knows about. Most crucially that Mikado and Sayo have suffered as well and are far more than simple villains. She reduces them into others to characters, all while believing that there's an objective truth about the world which she can find and act upon. But as the rest of this game and even this ending contradicts, that isn't true. A story that can explain everything perfectly, a story that is objective, is not real and can never be real. Life is too chaotic, people too complex, for a single narrative to ever be able to explain everything and account for every fact. No human event, no interaction, no anything can be boiled down to a pure essence, and to believe so is possible is merely an ideal. Truth is something we should and need to strive for with balance to human emotions and care for other people. Living in deceit obviously should not be something we do. But as Amy hypocritically says herself when explaining to Koichi why she didn't tell him about the world up front, trying to force your ideals, your truth, onto other people is self-righteous. People need help and guidance and we should be curious about others, but to force them to believe something just because you believe it's correct is not right. People need to come to their own conclusions with or without others' help. This isn't even getting into the fact that truth itself is often a very subjective matter, something touched upon in an absolute clusterfuck of a full screen text dump. The brief is that it questions the subjectivity of reality through the example of an apple. It's something we all agree upon as red and we collectively know this to be true, but what happens when someone claims it's blue? Are they wrong for this? Can they prove they're wrong? And if someone can question this objective truth, then is it really objective? Though that's some real philosophy 101 stuff on the surface, the way it's contextualized here is an example of why it can be difficult to produce a whole truth, one which grasps the entire picture of something, is fascinating. And it's something I think about a lot as I look back on my past. Having grown up in a household where I was regularly neglected and abused, with that neglect and abuse excused through further neglect and abuse, I always feel as if details from my truth are missing whenever I try to spin events that have happened into some cohesive narrative. As much as journaling is important to me, as much as conveying my story through these videos is one of the most important things in my life, and as much as I feel it is necessary for me to create cohesion out of the chaos in my life, I sometimes can't escape that painful sense of my memories being shattered that I'll never be able to tell the truth. That is obviously patently not true. My memories are my memories. They are what they are, and they are as true as I can possibly find them to be. But it's hard for me to feel firm in that conviction, because trauma can do this really funny thing, where it fractures your sense of time and narrative in your mind. For those who suffer symptoms of traumatic disorders, the need to refigure one's self-narrative time and time again can be an insurmountable hurdle in the search for one's psychological stability and well-being. For those who have undergone traumatic experiences and are compelled to write about the past, this obstacle is further complicated by problems of self-empathy and a fixed negative autobiographical narrative created by a damaged retrieval system. In this way, post-traumatic memory texts may be seen to arise in a self-perpetuating, self-generating system in which an insistence on the value of self-examination is corrupted by a self-identity that is lost in time. A perpetual, self-consuming Ouroboros. 
On one hand, journaling and creating narratives of life is of incredible importance for people who have been traumatized. Creating stories is one of the few ways we can not only convey to others the pain we've felt and the experiences we've lived, but that we can convey them to ourselves and validate them as things that have happened. I don't think I would have made half the improvements I have on my mental health if I wasn't journaling, writing about my life, and telling stories about it in these videos. It's through all of this that I've been able to work through some of my most painful memories and that I've been able to create some sense of a life and a past that I've lived. Telling stories about our lives to other people is one of the most important things we can do. It's how we grow, it's how we reflect, and it's how we realize what we do and do not want to be anymore. But there is a danger to it that I've fallen to more times than I can count. In attempting to distill all of these experiences I've had into stories, I've found myself with a need to make sure I wasn't lying to others or myself. I've pursued truth single-mindedly, attempting to recall and put together every single shred that would allow me to craft a bigger picture that accounted for every quirk of every person who had hurt me, so I could be utterly certain that I was in fact telling the truth about my abuse. That I was the trope of the perfect victim. The only kind of victim I had known to exist, so that no one could look at my pain and tell me it didn't happen. Like events on a flowchart, I recalled and remembered parts of my life and wove them into stories, stringing them together into a grander narrative that at many times I felt made some sense. There were points, for weeks or months at a time, that I felt I had finally been able to explain my life. The tale of a girl who escaped abuse and forced her own path forward. But life and reality aren't so simple. In time, I'd recall something else about the people who'd hurt me. I'd recall something I did to hurt someone else. And suddenly, this story I had figured out, these roles people played in my life that I had thought accounted for all of the complexity, shattered. Because some new thing came to attention out of the depths of my fractured memory. Some new thing that again opened the doubts, and the process began again. A perpetual, self-consuming, Ouroboros of a self-narrative which sought truth to escape criticism from others and myself, which could convince even the abusers I had been abused. A story which could never be created without lies, and which forgot the very reason why I had been telling people stories about myself in the first place, why I had been telling myself stories about myself. I wanted others to know how I felt in this world, in my reality. In the end, stories can never be anything more than singular narratives, representing mere idealized microcosms of reality. And though an ideal is something we should strive for, those stories are often beautiful and moving, though they are something we need to make sense of ourselves and others, and though we as humans need stories to carry us through the hell that is life, to remind us of the beauty that exists, they are not life itself. They can never account for all that exists within ourselves. They can never account for the new things that we remember. And that's okay. It's okay to live in that ever-changing past, present, and future. It's okay for you to remember that your life is different than the narratives you've made about it. Because what you have felt and lived is more valuable than mere fiction. If the message simply stopped here at narratives can become violence, then I would be ready to say that Sui Senka is an incredibly saddening, albeit truthful game, because while that is depressing, it's not at all wrong, right? You only have to go glance at the news for a moment to see how we spin stories that try to simplify complex events and narratives down to simple actors, good and bad, usually really pro-war. We take entire humans and simplify their experiences into familiar concepts that strip them of their agency. Even beyond nonfiction, we do this. After all, how much fiction has been written that takes real people and real cultures and distills them into similarly destructive archetypes and tropes? That fiction gets used to perpetuate those archetypes, those stereotypes. It gets used to hurt others as a weapon of violence fueling everything from slivers of superficial judgment all the way to violent hatred of other people. People take all these narratives and a hundred other things together and spin them into a larger story about how life should be lived and spin it into society. We look at heroes from our past, heroes who have had their misdeeds wiped from the record, and we look at characters from our present fiction, characters who embodied ingrained societal roles to a perfect extent, and judge others by those absurd standards. We take all of that and we build a narrative for our life out of it. We take all of that and we build narratives for others out of it, and inflict violence when we can't meet them, when they can't be the perfect resilient hero, when they can't be the perfect passive heroine, when they can't be the perfect victim among so many other stereotypes. 
these are all things that I think are unfortunately very true because I've experienced a lot of violence from a lot of them. But I also think that this game manages to take all of that and find a story of hope somewhere in it. Because at the end of it all, Goichi escapes the narrative. It's frightening and uncertain, and the parting from the story is sad, but he is still able to look forward to a life with no clear path set. A life that embraces life for the chaotic mess that it is, even if it's not easy to do so. Because truthfully, the hope that stories offer is so tantalizing that it's easy to want to get lost in them. I can't deny that I too am victim to those urges. Not just what I've talked about earlier with crafting narratives of my past, but with media. There's many times I'll look at a story and think, maybe this will be the one to make sense of my life. And certainly, stories are something that have played a massive role in me growing as a person. It's through the tales I praise on this channel and so many others that I've been able to grow and find myself one piece at a time. But it's only pieces. Because just as there's never going to be a story that explains all of the world, just as I'll never be able to explain all of my past, there's never going to be a story that completely heals all of me. No matter how much Eroge I play, no matter how much otaku media I consume, no matter how many movies I watch, no matter how many albums I listen to, I'll never be able to fix myself all at once. I can just pick up the pieces, bit by bit, and I think that's okay. I think this is why Sui Senka's ending is simultaneously melancholic, but also really hopeful. It's melancholic because as a story, it has to terminate itself by whatever means are available to it. It doesn't have the power to close its own program, to shut its own book, or to reject its own disc. The story can only ever reach a definitive end with all who can observe it either leaving or dying, Goichi as the last man standing with nowhere left to run. But we don't live in a story as characters. We as people live in a world where we have the agency to terminate the narratives forced onto us in live in the world as a who we are, we can accept that sorrow and suffering are as much a part of life as joy and happiness are, and cherish the stories we've known as reminders of what we wish for in our lives, as we navigate them day by day, minute by minute, and second by second. Lives that we live not in search of a pure truth which ignores feelings. Lives that we live not in search of a meaningless everyday that strips us of our emotion and color. Lives that we live not seeking to be a hero or heroine. Lives that we live as ourselves. What I think makes this idea of living for yourself special here is that Sui Senka is not proposing that we live a unique story about our lives. It isn't saying that every person is special and has a special story to tell, something that I think people who say kind of miss the point, as so many of us, especially those who are marginalized, have no framework with which to build our stories. So many of the narratives of the world are built for cis, white, and abled people living in privileged classes, and what few narratives pretend to exist for the rest of us are built hastily off the rusted scratch discarded from those dominant narratives. Our lives are in constant flux as the roles of our world, not unlike those of the story, shift out from under us. Laws and social changes that exist merely to try and erase us. Even if we had a stable framework to build our stories off of, who's going to say it's gonna last a year, a month, a week, a day? All people already live in instability as sudden life events and other things change their trajectories, but we don't even get a solid foundation to hold us steady through that. That. What the story Hain tells proposes is that we do not need a narrative to live to begin with. And for me, I feel that's the reassurance I needed at this point in my life. Though I was once given a story to live, the story that so many men have, I do not know where my life and the lives of many other people regarded as abnormal and unwanted by the systems that govern us is headed. I could try and fit myself into another narrative, but any I did would fail to account for the peculiarities and complexities of my life. I would be excluding facts and aspects of myself that make me who I am to purify myself into something else that fits within the system. But I don't need to find or make such a narrative to exist. I just simply can and should. Life, though chaotic, absurd, and painful, is still full of wonder, purity, and joy. Stories exist so we can distill all that is human into tales that we can pass on to others, as ideals and beauty to remind us what we live for when the chaos, absurdity, and pain takes over. But we don't have to be mere pawns and actors to the systems that govern us and attempt to create narratives for us. Kill your past and embrace the unknown future. Kill the narrative you live under and live your life as you. Not as hero or heroine, not as caricature or trope, but a person. Live life for what exists in reality, in humanity. Find pride in what you desire to be, no matter how far it deviates from the person you were told to be. Because you do not need a role to live. All you need to live is the simple pride in knowing that you are you and no one else.
The term hidden gem is one that I feel gets thrown around far too much these days. People are willing to call almost anything that hasn't achieved Call of Duty or Persona 5 levels of success hidden, even when there's hundreds of thousands of people who will clamor for that game the second it gets brought up. And people will call just about anything a gem simply because it's slightly obscure, even when it is an absolute mess. But every once in a while, I stumble upon something that I feel is, well, hidden and a gem, with just barely over a hundred people recorded as having played it across both major visual novel aggregate sites, and surely even fewer who actually have seen it all the way through. Sui Senka doubtlessly has to be one of the most obscure games I've reviewed on this channel, and I honestly think that's a shame, because it's also one of the most fascinating stories I've gotten to experience. It is one of those rare titles that only comes once in a blue moon when a group of passionate creators are given the freedom to make something they really believe in, with the resources and knowledge to be able to pull it off. And like many of those honest, challenging works, it's something that can be kind of difficult to play, but the fact it's been relegated to such obscurity that practically nobody has even had the chance to is sad to me. I really sincerely hope that it gets translated into English because of the endearing love and popularity of unsettling, metafictional, self-critical stories that already exist as anything to go by, I think there's a lot of people who would fall in love with it. It's also somewhat reassuring that Sui Senka's seeming failure at retail didn't stop all of its creative forces dead in their tracks. Though some of the voice actors and assistant artists sadly didn't get much work after it, Haynes seen some decent success writing for a whole slew of games both as commission and independent work, and Sapporo Momoko's continued to score and illustrate for a similar mixture of random offbeat nukige and weird passion projects. Whether or not many of those come close to the thematic power of Sui Senka is something I don't know, as, with exception to having played some of Momoko's other works, I'm not too familiar with either of those two's other creations. But I do feel regardless of how fantastic they may be, the way Sui Senka came together in the end really is lightning in the bottle. There is no other art I've experienced that uses a meta narrative to achieve even half of what this game does. Commentary on the nature of storytelling, on our often destructive urges to be able to explain our lives with stories, on the harm caused by tropes and characterizing others, on the way trauma fragments people, all wrapped up with a hopeful message that we can live for our sake and not that of a story people assign to us. With the era we live in now, I think that message is more important than ever. As society at large fights to keep people stuck within roles and narratives, silencing those who do not fit in, we can still stand proud knowing we do not have to sit down and take it. We do not have to fit into others' molds to have a right to exist. We do not need to fit into a common story to have a right to exist, because we are not simple characters in a play. We are not heroes, heroines, or side characters. Life is too complicated for any one story, even hundreds of thousands, to capture all of humanity. They are ideals to look to, to guide us through the chaos of life, and guide us they shall, as reminders of what's beautiful in the world that we all live in, as reminders that we are all who we are, and nobody else.